All right, so this is a video for um, understanding how to design a system, especially web applications. Uh, but the concepts mentioned in this video are not only applicable for designing web applications, but in any type of software. Um, but the processes and the steps will be especially um, targeted for web applications. So, what I'm going to be sharing is based on my experience. In this world of how to build software, there are a lot of different opinions and a lot of different ways of building a good software. Um, so I'm going to try to lay out some general principles that I think are important. But do understand that this is based on my experience. And other people would have different opinions about how things should be architected. But I'm hoping that me sharing this will help you understand how I would go about in building a web application, a complex web application, and what technologies I would use, what programming languages I would use, which frameworks I would use, what services I would use, and what type of questions uh, I would ask. Uh, this could be especially helpful if you are working as a contractor and you're trying to explain to a potential client how you would go about building the system because they maybe want to know how you, how you would go about and they may ask you, well, why are you using Python versus Ruby or versus Node versus JavaScript, uh, you know, or something like that. So this can also be helpful if you are getting ready for technical interviews and the hiring manager asks you, if you're building an application that has X, Y, and Z, how would you go about building that? Okay, so it's applicable for all of that. Uh, so depending on where you come from, it will probably have different uh, lessons for you. Okay, so I'm going to be sharing uh, steps that I follow. This took me a while to document, and I actually didn't even know whether it was possible to document my workflow like this. But I tried, and I think I came up with something that's quite unique. So I hope you like it. All right, so let's go right to the document. So this is my process. I was trying to think, when, when someone asked me, Michael, how would you build an application that does ABC? Well, usually I have some strong opinions about what language you should use, what framework you should, what you should not do. I have some stronger opinion about that. But how do I actually come up with those insights? And is there a way that I can actually create a process diagram that anyone can follow to leverage my years of enterprise web application development experience? And initially, I thought, no, it's not possible. It's just based on a bunch of experiences and insights, and it's intuition. But once I started writing down, well, let me see if I can actually do this to help people, I was surprised. And I was able to do it. So I think this is basically my 12 years of know-how and knowledge about system architecture in five pages. Um, know, please, that I'm still learning. There are all these new tools that are coming out. You know, I don't know everything. Um, you know, there are some things that I know, but a lot of these things that are coming out right now, especially technologies that are going through a lot of innovations, I have to constantly learn. So, you know, you may have uh, some developers with ex more experience than me on some of those, those parts that have innovation that you can also learn from. So uh, we're all learners here in life. So uh, let's not try to um, fight over who is right and who is wrong, but try to understand each other's point of view and learn. And you know, uh, hopefully a lot of these things can be internalized. So let's say in this hypothetical scenario, your client or supervisor wants you to design how you would build a complex web app. Or it could be your uh, potential supervisor who wants to hire you. And they say, hey, I, I have this application. How would you go about building it? Well, the wrong thing to do is spit out answers. Never spit out answers right away. You know that if you spit out answers just right away, it's like imagine you meet with me and um, I say, hey, I want you to build a house. It's a five bedroom house and a three bath. And if you just go and build that house right away, like what's going on? Or imagine even worse, I say, yeah, I want to build a simple, simple house that's five bedroom, three bath, 
How much is it going to cost? How long is it going to take? Are you going to give me the answer right away and say, Michael, it's gonna, I can do it in two years or one year and it's going to cost you half a million dollars? I'll be like, oh, that's a good deal. Because what I'm thinking is, I'm thinking about a 15,000 square foot mansion with five huge rooms and three huge bathrooms that's like the size of a swimming pool. And you quoted me half a million dollars. All right, I got a sweet deal. And you said you're going to build it in how long? Six months? One month? Or one year? All right, good. Okay, you're hooked. And if you don't build it in six months or a year, you're screwed. If you aren't, if you need more than half a million dollar, then, well, I'll refer to the contract that you sign, right? I won't do that, but it's some of your potential customers may, right? Never run into that trap. When they're saying it's a simple house, and to a client, it's always simple. They may not know how to build it, but to them, it's always simple, right? Um, and it may be simple in their mind, but in a, actually to build it, it may not be so simple, right? I'm not looking down at them, right? Because again, they don't understand what the efforts that needs to go inside. Maybe the idea is simple, right? But it, it requires a very complex implementation. But anyway, what they're thinking in their head about a three-bedroom house or a five-bedroom house and what you're thinking is not going to be the same. The way you do it is by asking questions. Listen before jumping in. Ask a lot of questions and don't assume. That's one of the key principles. Okay, so I tried to put the key principle in the yellow bucket. And how you do it, I put some tips in blue, right? Why we do things is almost always more important than how we do things. Although both combined is what makes things very powerful, right? If you don't know why you're doing things, but you just follow steps, then you become a typist. If you're not a developer, you're a typist. If you are, um, if you only know why things should be done, but you don't know how to do it, then maybe you can be a good manager, but it will limit your ability to create things. So you need both the why, right, the principles behind it, as well as how to do things. So if I was in this stage, I would ask questions to better understand, right? Some of the questions you can ask could be, hey, how many developers will be working on this? How many front and back end? Because some of these, you will find out that um, a lot of your um, process will depend on your existing team. You can ask them, what are the languages and frameworks these fr uh, developers already know? That's important because to learn another language and framework will take a long time. Uh, sometimes if you have crappy documentations that you're going through and you don't have the mentorship that you need, it could take maybe a year to three years for you to get familiar with one language and framework. Right? You don't want to go through all that time. So find out who will be working on this. Right? Or am I the only person working on it? Right? What part of this, you can ask them even questions such as what part of this application do you think will get the most traffic? Will have the most bottleneck? You can ask them. They would have some ideas. How important, and this is this is a good question I think about. How important is speed of development versus stability of the project or stability of the application? Do you, if you could only pick one, not both, right? Where one, we're building things fast, but we have bugs along the way. We catch them, but there are bugs along the way, but we value speed to be a lot more important than uh, stability. Then we go one route. If they say, no, we can't tolerate any bug, I would sacrifice how fast we build things to have a more stable version, then it will also affect your system design. Right? Ask them some of those questions in advance so you can you can choose. They will always want both, but you cannot have both. Right? Ask them which one would you would you go with? And there are some other questions that you can ask. You can ask them, are there other APIs or microservices that we can utilize that you know of? Right? And this is some of some of these are good questions that you can even pose during interviews. How would you design something, something, something? Well, which part of this application would you anticipate the most traffic and bottleneck and why, right? Worst thing to do when you're going through interview is not to ask questions and just assume. Ask them questions, dialogue, okay? Any specific preferences on which programming language framework or test framework? Because they may have some strong opinions. Some of them may say, I don't care, you pick, that's fine. 
If some of them say, I really want you to build something in X, Y, Z, well, go on and put that into thought. Okay, step number one is that. Step number two, research phase. So don't go and just build things. There may be some other libraries or modules that could, or APIs that could really make the job easy. So go on and do some research, maybe five, 10 hours of research to find out what is already available. If someone already built some modules that you can utilize, why spend months building that yourself when you can just tap into that and use it, especially if those are open source. There is a trap that you can fall into. You got to limit the amount of time you do research because some developers may spend too much time just researching and piecing together other people's code rather than actually uh, building uh, their own, that is a dangerous trap. Uh, and that is a trap that developers who don't feel quite comfortable with the core building blocks and they, they're not at the point where they can actually create these frameworks and libraries, uh, they tend to lean on other people's code that much, but resist that temptation, but also don't go overboard and develop everything from scratch yourself too, especially if there are some strong libraries and modules, plugins and APIs that you can use to um, to build this okay all right so if you're doing any machine learning things make sure you look into python libraries to see if there are some libraries that you can uh, leverage a lot of the machine learning algorithms um, some of those things may be available through python why train your data set and create new uh, new code for you when you can just leverage existing code and data that's available out there Right, so do the research. Step three is you choose a programming language and frameworks. Step four is then you choose the data, where you're going to store the data. Step five is then you figure out how you're going to deploy in the cloud. Step six is how you're going to manage all the different services. So now I'm going to go through more in depth how I do step three, four, five, and six. So step three. Let's just walk through some of it. And this will be available, and I'll try to update this as we go. But um, let's just go through one by one. And I'm going to go slow intentionally so that you're not overwhelmed and we can cover some of the important steps. So um, it's a passive way of learning. Uh, the active way of learning is by you actually applying this into a real application and you know finding things that works and things that I may have put down here. You're discovering that. and adding it to your own workflow. But for now, passive mode is okay. Uh, let's go through step by step. One of the first question I ask always is, is there anything that needs to be done in real time? So imagine like a drawing app, live chat, or drawing app where people can collaborate and draw things together. Things like Google Doc, where multiple people can collaborate. PowerPoint, you know, um, where multiple people are creating slides. Well, I don't know if that's really collaborative, but real time, right? Real time alert services. Is there anything? If there is, only build that component, the real time component as a separate app. Okay. A separate app is also, we're just going to call it a microservice. Those are interchangeable. Okay. A small app that's built is especially for a specific purpose is also called a microservice, but it's just an app. Okay. So only build that component using Node.js, Express, and Socket. But why? Why? Why not build everything in Express? So there may be some other frameworks in Node that you can use. Express is one of the dominant ones. But Node is quite new. There are frameworks that are more mature, such as Rails and Django and others. And they're meant to handle large, complex applications. But Express is not an MVC framework, although you could convert MV, uh, Express to be an MVC framework. It's not hard to do. But a lot of developers don't really use Node for that. They're using Node for very something very simple, for a very modular service. So it's best to just build that specific part of the application using Node because Node is phenomenal when it comes to uh, handling real time, especially with socket.io, okay? So build only that, create it as a microservice, and connect the other apps through APIs, 
which we'll talk a little bit later about. Okay, so that's important. Okay, mistake, big mistake is to build everything in one framework. Huge, huge, huge mistake. And to build that giant framework just using Node and Express, horrible mistake. You will run into issues. Never do that. Right? It's, again, Express is a light framework. Light framework is not a mature framework that's built to handle lots of codes. Okay? It, you could organize it, but again, it, it's just, you will probably run into issues. It's better to use a mature framework for something that will get large and use light framework for building things that are light. Right? Use things for what it's built for. Then I ask, is this a weekend project? If it is a weekend project, something that you can just put together in a, in a week, maybe a few weeks, yeah, you can use a light framework, not a full-blown MVC framework. So, for example, if you're using Python, use something like Flask. It's not MVC. You know, you can do things procedural, but it's a good framework, and it's, it, it doesn't come with the heavy weight of most MVC frameworks, so you use that. If you're using Ruby, you can use Sinatra instead of Rails. There are dozens of, of these light frameworks available for each of the programming languages. They all pretty much do the same thing. There's, you know, they're, they're again converging. So that's what you would do. Um, and you build that. And then another question I ask is, well, how many backend engineers will be working on this project? And the reason I, that we, I ask this is because this uh, principle here, having a small team of engineers per project is better. If you were to graph the, um, how efficient um, your software development is, and if you were to graph that with the number of engineers. So, okay, so, okay, so again, think about productivity on the y-axis and then the number of engineers. As you put in more engineers, is the productivity going to go up at a linear scale? So if the productivity was two, when you had two engineers, if you have four engineers, is the productivity going to be four? No. The way it works is actually kind of goes in a linear fashion, and then it kind of tapers off, and then it starts actually going down as you put more engineers. So what is the ideal number of engineers, backend engineers, you should put on the project? Different people would have different opinions. Some There's a pizza rule where... You know, never have a bigger team in your bigger engineering team than um, who you can feed with a single pizza slide, pizza pie. But that depends on the country too. And you know, if you if you live in a country where they eat a lot, maybe <laughs> that the answer will depend, right? So my rule of thumb is, you know, five to ten. I think is a good size. Ten is kind of you're going to the large number. Five, that's good, right? You can go have lunch together. You can talk to each other. Uh, but the communication, number of steps needed for communication goes exponentially as, you, as the team size grows. So you only want a small team. And a small team can do some powerful things. Uh, some of the you know, world's uh, really awesome software were built just by half a dozen engineers working on it. it. You will be impressed. You can do a lot, right? So the idea is have a small team of engineers per project to increase efficiency. So if you need more than 10 engineers, then it's simple. Find a way to break it. Find a way to break that app into multiple microservices or multiple apps. So for example, if you're building something like TurboTax online, is that one giant app? And should we build that in Ruby, Python? Ooh, you know, do you, and you put hundreds of engineers working on it? No way. You want to break it into microservices. So you may have one app that just handles, for example, the website. What people, when they go to TurboTaxOnline.com, the website they see that, that's all it does. Very simple. Maybe one just, you know, uh, goes talk to the county records, maybe specific county records, and just retrieve some of the tax information available for that county, and that's all it does. Another app would maybe just do the computation for the state of California. Another app, microservice, would do something else. Or another state. Maybe you have another microservice that talks to these two other microservices and just coordinates the information in between. Right? You can almost always look at a giant system and figure out a way to break it into pieces. What does that do? That makes it so that uh, I have a small team of engineers per project. It's efficient. Teamwork is there. Uh, no one's overriding someone else's code by mistake. And things are a lot better. Okay? So you break it down. 
And then for each of the project now, for each of the microservice, you ask which one is more important, speed or stability? And they say, hey, we have zero customers right now. We got to build things fast, fast, fast and launch. What do you do? Well, speed is more important. So maybe you don't worry so much about test cases. You just write things, right? If uh, stability is important because you already have lots of customers, you can't afford mistakes, find a framework or find a language that come with some strong test cases. I personally uh, like RSpec and Capybara a lot. Um, there are some other frameworks, testing frameworks that are really cool. Uh, and again, even if one language is kind of was tended, ten, tended to be weaker on testing, it will get better over time. All of these technologies are kind of merging, converging. So pick, a, pick, pick one that you know that has a good test framework if stability is really important, right? If not, then you don't really need a language that comes with a strong test framework. Right? Especially after later on, you can just add you know, some of the, some of the integrated integration tests later on. Okay, so once you know, speed is important, then you just don't build it. I, I do ask, you know, does it require any machine le learning or any like, heavy math computation, statistical analysis? If that's the case, Python has a lot of you know, great libraries because Python was used a lot by scientists and engineers. So scientists, naturally, they needed to do a lot of math. So they built a lot of Python libraries for math. And this is, again, why Python is such a popular language for machine learning, because machine learning is just a lot of computational math. Well, in a nutshell, right? So Python is great, because it already has all these libraries that Python scientists built. So that's the reason why Python, Python is the popular language for machine learning. So anyway, do that. OK, so now, um, let's see, does it need a lot of math computation, then yeah, you use like Python. Uh, if not, you can then, what framework you use? I mean, use an MVC framework as the foundation. I really think they're all similar anyway. Uh, if you are pretty new, then use a easier framework to learn, such as, well, Django is not so easy, but it's not too hard. Um, if you're doing PHP, pick anything like Laravel, Coding Night, or Zen. If you're doing Java, you can do Spring or some other things. Java and C Sharp will have a little bit higher learning curve than some of the other languages. But again, most of the MVC frameworks are kind of converging. They're all becoming really similar to each other, so I don't think it would matter. And then once you design these projects, then you create API calls so that they can talk to each other. Okay? All right. Uh, so that's the principle. Once you have a lot of different microservices, then you can either build your own API or later on uh, introduce some other services created by other people that you can use to connect some of these apps to communicate with each other. Some of those other service layers I'll introduce a little bit later. Okay, but the key principle is have a small team, okay, connect multiple apps using API. And then when you do this, you're utilizing strengths of each language and framework. Now, if you have a lot of different experience with multiple frameworks, then you will have some strong reference. For example, you know, I have some, some strong opinions about how Django ORM is done, uh, and I have some strong opinions about how what I like and dislike about uh, multiple frameworks. But I built that over the years because I've used them all. Um, well, all the ones that I know, and maybe uh, half a dozen to a dozen frameworks. So if you don't have a strong preference, just go with what you're comfortable with. Uh, but if you happen to have used a lot of different frameworks, then just leverage you know, your preference and, you know, pick the one that um, has particular strengths that you want to you wanna do, okay? All right, another thing to remember is don't over-engineer. You can also over-engineer on the test cases. And sometimes to build one feature, you're writing too many test cases and it really slows things down. So you also want to have a find, find a good balance on how many tests to write and how quickly you implement the features. That's really important. So this is the back end. What about the front end? Well, does your app need to be a single page? A lot of developers love single page. They love, they love learning new technology. So you know, they want to build something using the latest React or Angular or JavaScript library to create a single page application because they want to learn cool, te cool technologies other than just using um, what they are familiar with. And I understand that. But you should really ask, well, if we are building things for the client, we got to ask, um, does it really need to be a single page? A lot of times it doesn't need to be. 
so if it doesn't need to be, hey, uh, don't build it as a single page. Um, and my rule of thumb is does for each of the route, uh, the URL, how many JavaScript lines would it need to um, handle the interaction? And if I think, you know, a few thousand lines, okay, maybe you don't actually need a heavy framework like React and Angular. And of course, that depends on preference. That's just my personal kind of gauge to see, well, do I need to just build it just using plain JavaScript and use my knowledge in OOP to organize my JavaScript code and maybe create a light framework? Or should I, you know, use a heavy framework like, you know, React and Angular? So you can, you know, do that. Okay, so again, the key thing is don't over-engineer it. You need, you're gonna have just maybe a few hundred lines of JavaScript and you're gonna use React? Ooh, why? There's gonna be a learning curve if you use those heavy frameworks and then it will just slow things down. Um, yes, it will, you know, scratch your curiosity, but, you know, speed is also important for, for the business and, and the customer, okay? So remember that. All right, step four. All right, so now you know we figured out which language, which framework you use, whether it's going to be one one app or multiple microservices. Right, you broke that down, and of course, all of this you got to practice. You got to build some real applications and really put this into use. Well, for each of the app or each of the microservice, you also have to think about where am I going to store the data? What is my process? Michael Choi's process. So then I ask any data large files, long text blob that could be stored in services like Amazon S3. The rule is do not store that in your database. Do not store a large file into your database. Can you store a large file into your SQL database? Yes, you can, but do not. It will slow things down. It will make your database too big. Keep your database small. Store those files in Amazon S3 or some other services that you like and simply store the link to that file. That will make sure that your database stays small. You want a small database, right? So, you know, that's really, really important. And then you ask yourself, is, the, is any data, uh, does, it, does it need to be stored permanently for years, for months? If the answer is yes, then you look one way. If you're like handling, doing things that are in real time, Maybe information that you got five seconds ago, once it's been delivered, maybe you don't need to store it. If you don't need to store it, you can consider just using a memory-based database such as Redis, Memcache, and other things. There are probably dozens, half a dozen to a dozen, maybe more, memory-based database that you can look, and you can use those. Because memory-based database is really quick too. And now memory is really cheap compared to before. So you can store a lot of things in memory compared to before. Gigabytes and gigabytes. So you can consider that. But if, you, if it does need to be stored, then the question I ask is, do you need to store, do you need to do um, relational or non-relational database? Okay, that one is a little bit tricky. Let me, let me see if I can use an, use an example here. Okay, so I switched over to my iPad with the Apple Pencil. How do you tell whether you need a relational database or non-relational database? Um, let me see if I can explain that just very, very quickly, or as quickly as I can. The way to think about that, and the analogy that I've used is, maybe there's a better analogy, but let me try this one, is let's say, you decide to store information on a piece of paper. And you're going to store that in a cabinet drawer, right, our database. Ask yourself, what type of record do you want to store into this cabinet? So you're going to insert a paper, but how do you want this information to look like? Relational is where uh, the field types are specified. So imagine you get this empty form and it says, fill in your name, fill in your age, fill in your uh, city, and fill in some other things, right? If these are filled and there is an empty space that you want to fill out, so you pull out this empty record, you fill out the blank, and you want to store that into the cabinet, then you want to go relational. 
right? If you want these fields predefined. Non-relational is more open. And it can be like the left side is also blank. Fill in whatever you want. That's non-relational. And you might be thinking, what? Okay, maybe I confused you more. Let me give you an example. Imagine that I wanted you to create a web application to store any information you can find from anyone in the world. Relational approach is, okay, I'm going to find out their name, age, city, birth date, and blah, blah, blah. You can imagine how that could work. But maybe, oh, you come to me, I'm managing this cabinet, and you say, hey, Michael, you know, I need to fill out uh, this information for this new person in the world. How long do you think that paper that I'm going to give you is? Maybe 50 pages, maybe hundreds of pages, because every single thing that you might want to capture, like hobbies, you know, their first boyfriend, girlfriend, um, you know, like their favorite dessert, all of that would be a field on the left. And then, so a lot of that information, a lot of that information, right, you may just leave it empty, right? Like maybe they don't want to tell you what their hobbies are, so you skip that part. Right? But you can imagine it could be pages and pages. Right? So that's the relational approach. Sometimes this works, and most of the data is stored in relational. Uh, but if you don't want that, and you just want to say, Michael, just give me a piece of paper and let me write whatever I want and store whatever I want, then you can do that. So for that particular example, the non-relational uh, has some benefit, right? Because you can just say, oh, they wanted me to tell, uh, they wanted me, to, they told me about hobbies, so let me write down what their hobbies are. The downside of non relational is can you imagine another worker may have put hobby instead of hobbies? So now you got all these data that is similar, but you got to kind of clean up the data yourself. That could be a problem with non-relational database because developers may store information all a little bit differently and to clean that up could be a nightmare, right? But it has the flexibility. Usually with any pros and strengths comes this disadvantage, right? So those are some of the trade-offs. So again, if you're building a web application, you can say, do I want to give my workers a preformed field on the left on what fields I want them to record? and then send it to the database, or do I want to just give them a blank sheet? Okay, the, and I think that will kind of give you a good idea on whether you want to use a relational or non-relational database. So that's usually what I ask. And if it is a relational database, then I ask myself, how big will the data get in the next three to five years? And this is a very soft rule of thumb. Um, and technology gets better, so this limit will change too. Um, at the time of this video, Amazon relational database will handle data up to 16 terabyte. That's huge, huge, huge. Uh, but depending on, I mean, if you're uh, logging everything that's happening in the world, I mean, you will need a lot of data storage, but most of the web applications will be fine with one terabyte or less or significantly less. So you can use MySQL, Postgres, MariaDB, or one of them. There are slight differences. The databases you, sh you shouldn't use are things that are used for more development and testing. Um, or for people to level up. So I wouldn't use SQLite, but you know, MySQL, Postgres, MariaDB, Cassandra, all these other things, they all work pretty well. But it does hit a limit when you get into the certain size, usually by the size of the hard disk, hard drive. So uh, if the hard drive later comes out in a computer and it has 100 terabytes, then you know, your uh, database can probably handle up to that. But right now, most of the hard drives are like one terabyte, so that's the limit. Uh, if you need something more, you can go into Amazon RDS. Every single cloud services will offer these as a service that you can just tap into. If you need something more than that, you can use Oracle. If you need something way more than that, use Hadoop, big data. Again, you can set up Oracle servers yourself. You can set up Hadoop servers yourself or Amazon, Microsoft, Google Cloud already set it up and you can just use their service. Right? They made things a lot easier. Before they had the services, you had to go learn it, build it, and then deploy it, manage it all yourself. But now there are platform as a service that you can use to do that. Okay, uh, same, same rule applies to non-relational. You can use something like MongoDB if you're doing non-relational. 
Uh, MongoDB may be able to handle a lot more, so I'll always look up to the documentation to see what it can handle. But if you need something way bigger, then you know, um, rely on Amazon AWS or look up some other services to see if you can you know, leverage that. I'll put some links so you can find out from Amazon what different database products they offer. All right, so this is the thought process. Database is usually not that hard. It's pretty straightforward. All right, let's talk about the next step, choosing your testing deployment process for each app or microservice. So the first is you set up the, you, you, GitHub can be used as a collaboration tool. Um, we, there are so many ways that you can use Git in a lot of different ways. But the way that I do it personally is I would create a GitHub for each repository for each of the project that I'm building, okay? And then I ask myself, does this need to support multiple versions of your products? So for example, if you're creating some desktop app, you need to support version 1.9, 2.1, 2.4, 2.6, then you go into this bucket. If you don't, because it's just one version that you need to support, and you're not, it's a relatively simple project, what do I mean? Maybe it doesn't really require like five plus full-time backend engineers to work on projects for months, then you follow this bucket, okay? And if, you, if it is a simpler project and you only need to maintain one version, use what's called a GitLab flow. Okay, you can read a little bit more about this. It's great for managing simple projects and you can read more information in the links over here. If the comp project is more complex, you use what's called a Git flow. And you have one repository where the source code is uh, there and then you don't have the developers uh, work on that repository as collaborators. What you do is you have them fork that repository. You create what's called um, a separate branch. And then that's where uh, different people work on that separate branch. And they submit a pull request uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the main repository or the original repository. This will take some time for you to get familiar. Uh, but most teams, I would say, follow uh, these two approaches, at least the companies that I'm, I'm aware of in Silicon Valley. So, and you, there are some additional links here uh, on the bottom where you can learn more about these different branching technologies. Now, when you do this, what you can do is you can set up hooks. So whenever certain events happen in your Git, you can have it trigger something. So for example, what you can do is um, you can set it up so that when the pull request is sent, you can tie it up with tools like Jenkins. So a tool like Jenkins, what it does is it listens for a pull request. And it's like, oh, someone wants you to merge your code to this code base. They submit a pull request. You can deploy, have Jenkins deploy that code somewhere in the cloud, run the test cases, and see if it broke anything. So imagine you worked on a feature, you submit a pull request, Jenkins runs and says, oh, I, your code just broke five features. Isn't that cool? Like they, it automatically found out, maybe it worked on your local environment, but it broke the staging. So it runs it automatically. If it passed the test cases, then the engineering lead then reviews it. If it didn't pass, then you, you're notified and you have to fix your code until the test cases pass, right? So uh, you can you know pull, go through more in detail, um, but basically you follow that process and uh, this process is called continuous integration, and you know there are more steps, but this is kind of a nutshell. When people talk about continuous integration, that's what they're talking about. So that you're working on the code, submitting pull requests, it runs the test cases automatically, so a few times a day, even, you can get constant feedback, like, oh, okay, this is working, it's been approved, it's automatically integrated. And you can have that happen a few times a day. Continuously, your code is being integrated with new features. So that's continuous integration. It's a cool buzzword, uh, but that's all that, all that means, okay? Uh, continuous delivery means, um, so once Jenkins, tools like Jenkins, Renan, the new features didn't break any test cases, then you can also set it up so it automatically updates staging. Your staging, and then, you know, the QA team can test it, your engineering lead can review it, you, you guys can test it, and then decide whether you want to update the production server with the latest code. 
So that's a continuous delivery. There is still some manual work. You can go even a step further. You have so many test cases that you're so confident that if it met the test cases, and Jenkins said there is no error in any of the test cases, then you can go and update the production. Isn't that amazing that you could just submit a pull request and you can see it live in production all continuously. So that's called continuous deployment. It's a form of a continuous delivery where you know all the manual process has been removed because your test cases are so strong. Okay. All right, let's go into now talk a little bit about uh, managing servers. Let me pull this out a little bit higher so you can see this. All right, let me let's go back to my other screen. All right, so remember that I can either have a bunch of web servers with the operating system. Um, and let me let me draw this again. So remember I had load balancers bunch of web servers. I had another load balancers and database. So it could be if it has the operating system, then you're doing it the traditional way. All right? These are the operating system. You need some way to manage this. So um, maybe you have services that automatically manage up and down uh, how you grow this and you have services to automatically manage this going up and down. Right? You can imagine that. You can also imagine if I have um, and all of this was one microservice. Okay, so all of that was a microservice. So now, that being a microservice, so when you think about the microservice, just imagine you can have a lot of different computers inside the microservice. You may have multiple microservices that need to communicate with each other now, right? So not only you needed some services that could coordinate some of the information in between here, now you need some things to coordinate information in between. So maybe you need another service here so that all the microservice sends data here. And then when there is any change, it propagates that back to these two. That's just another example, right? So you can imagine that not only do I need services to manage inside my um, microservice or app, I also need to orchestrate how all the different servers, uh, how the different services interact with each other. All right, so I know it gets, it's getting a little complex, but we're almost to the end. So if you're managing uh, just groups of servers, then you can buy the server at Amazon AWS or Azure or Google Cloud. Uh, Elastic Beanstalk is kind of the kind of it can be the ones to be the load balancer automatically and scale the servers up and down within that microservice, right? Um, and there are other services available. Microsoft has their own. Um, every single major cloud services have their own services that manage that. If you're doing containers using Docker's, then there are tools available to help you manage those containers. So you Get the containers, and then you, um, you can. There are services that scale up and down the number of containers. So those are, for example, Kubernetes, Elastic, uh, Amazon Elastic Container Service. This is the uh, Amazon's version of um, managing containers, similar to Docker. Uh, and there are, you know, Fargate, uh, Kubernetes Service, Azure has one, IBM has one. Uh, third parties like Rancher has this orchestration platform where you can manage. Um, you know, uh, containers through Kubernetes and other things. There are other services layer on top, for example, Elasticsearch. Um, and you, some of these, you can think of them as you can have servers use these tools, or you can have microservices talk to each other using these tools. But just to give you some example, Elasticsearch is a search engine based on the Lucene library. So maybe you want to record all of the logs of every single server. So instead of um, having one giant server that you create, you just use Elasticsearch and have all of the log file be sent to Elasticsearch, and then you can do a you can do a search um, on the Elasticsearch. Okay, Kibana is something that you can add on top of Elasticsearch data to to visualize uh, some of the log files. Uh, some of the other things, RabbitMQ, for example, is an open source message broker software. 
So um, instead of one, one microservice um, sending information to another microservice directly, you can have some intermediary, for example, where um, it can go. So just like in this example, let's say I have one microservice, one microservice, another one. I have a lot of different microservice. Um, I can have some intermediary where the message gets sent over here. And then when it's appropriate, it sends it to whoever it needs to get sent to. Right. So you can imagine when we do microservices, I have to really modularize. And you could create all of those systems yourself from scratch. Or you can see if there is a service, uh, which basically means someone else wrote it and you can pay them to use, use that uh, to help you manage these containers. So that's kind of at a high level how things work. It could get, I created this in it, you know, with the goal of providing as much detailed note as possible. So if you're creating an application or you're going, you're doing interview prep or uh, you're designing your next project, you would have some specific tips that you can follow on each step. But um, that caused me to talk a lot longer than I, than I usually do. But I hope this was helpful. So at a high level, you know, this is the picture. You need to work on a project. Listen before jumping in. Ask questions. Research with a limited time. Put a time cap on how much time you're going to put into research. Research some tools. And then figure out, okay, for... Um, each microservice that I need, okay, uh, what language and framework would be best with the goal that you want to keep the project small uh, with few engineers, not have one giant project in one framework with hundreds of developers. Don't make that mistake. Modularize it, break into microservices. For each of the microservice, then choose where, I'm, where am I going to store the data, okay, using the process that I, I, I outlined. And then for each of the microservices, figure out how I'm going to deploy this. And how I'm going to use GitHub. And how are we going to do continuous integration, continuous delivery? Do we need a lot of test cases? Are we going to use tools like Jenkins and so forth? And then once you design each of the microservices, now it's time to orchestrate all of the different microservices. Well, just know that there are a lot of tools available, or you can build it yourself uh, to help you manage your containers or multiple servers or multiple microservices. In a nutshell, that's how it works. So I hope it was helpful. If you found it helpful, uh, and if you haven't already, you know, please uh, subscribe so you can get uh, alerted of new things. But um, I hope it was helpful. And this is what happens in my brain as I think about system architecture. So um, I hope it was helpful for you. And I'll put some links uh, that may be helpful uh, for you to go deeper into this topic.